Morning. Uh, morning. Morning. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, today, the topic of our panel is your product went viral. Now what? And it was kind of inspired by this moment that happens early in an explosive startup's journey where everyone starts to kind of look around at each other and go, oh my gosh, this is working. But now we have the pressure of we have to actually scale this thing to 100 million, 200 million ARR and beyond. And that's just such an overwhelming journey. Um, so we wanted to talk through what that journey looked like at companies like Segment, Fivetran, Figma, uh, Dropbox, Slack, uh, and just kind of share learnings and best practices, what to repeat, what we wouldn't do again. And uh, I'm joined by Lauren Schwartz and Nairi Hordajan. Hordajan. Damn. Close. Close. <laughs> um, but let's start with intros. Um, Lauren, would you mind just kind of taking everyone through your background so everyone has context on kind of your journey? Sure, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you all. Uh, Lauren Schwartz, born and raised in the Bay Area. Can we start that far back? Uh, I started my career at Google, spent six years there learning the art of selling, and then went to business school at Stanford, followed by uh, four years at Segment, and just finished up three years at Fivetran. In those years, I really focused on building out our enterprise sales motion, both at Segment and at Fivetran. Uh, most recently, joined Fivetran to build the enterprise motion from the ground up, and I'm uh, really excited to be here. Thanks for including me. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm Nairi. Um, I guess I would say that if you told me 15 years ago I'd be working in SaaS, I would have said, WTF is that? <laughs> so I'm very happy to be with you today and also very happy to be working in SaaS, but it's definitely a career surprise. I started my career in politics. I spent the first 10 years in Washington, D.C. mostly, um, working in Democratic national politics, and then um, that left politics and uh, public affairs and joined Uber uh, in, early in Uber's journey. Uh, took a respite from operating life to run marketing, brand, and communications at a venture firm where I got a true exposure to enterprise, which is, was a big area of investment for us, and then missed operating and the mission of being in a company. So joined Figma about three years ago. Awesome. And my background, real quick, I started my SaaS career at Dropbox, um, then sold at Slack, and then led our SDR and new business teams at Clearbit before joining uh, Craft Ventures three years ago as an investor, and I'm a partner at the firm uh, now. And um, it's great to have you both. I'd love to start with uh, the Figma journey, it was one that we were talking about backstage, and just kind of famously was in the wilderness for a few years building this awesome product before launching. And I would just love to get your take on, you know, how Dylan talks about it, what that was like, just learning threat. Like, is that is that too long to build privately, or yeah. does it take that if you're building a really technical product? Yeah, I never think there's a one size fits all. But and I wasn't at Figma in those years. But the way that the team that was, including Dylan, talks about it is, we should have launched sooner. So they started the company. Dylan Field and Evan Wallace co-founded Figma in August of 2012. We just marked our 11 year anniversary since that moment. And you know, their first, the first thing they tackled was trying to figure out you know, what are we going to do with this amazing technology WebGL and what it enables that didn't exist before. Once they honed that plan and decided to go into interface and product design um, and development, you know, they spent almost three years building the product and then finally launched it in a closed beta in late 2015. And so, you know, that was a long road. And then they didn't open that beta until late 2016. And so that's a long road for the team. And, you know, they talk about wishing that they had actually like gone to market sooner um, just to get the product in the hands of users and start learning and iterating and testing. It's also a long time from an internal culture perspective to be working on something that you can't ship. And so um, for them, they feel like they could have gone maybe a little sooner, but they also wanted to like make it as perfect as they could before they did. We all know what that's like. So again, there's no one size fits all. I don't believe you have to do what's right for your business at that moment in time and what's going on in the market. Um, but that's that's the that's the lore from yeah, those days that totally. we talk about now. And I, I do want to talk about the difference between bottom up and top down products, um, which we'll get to in a moment. I think there's kind of an interesting contrast there, but. 
Figma as a bottom-up product, they probably felt more pressure to get it perfect. And I, I'm just curious if they could go back in time, was there a wedge that they would have focused on more closely? Like it, it's just gonna be interface design, we're not gonna do collaboration, we're just gonna focus on like, you know, UX and nothing else. I'm just curious if, if they talked about that at all. Yeah, so actually in that first um, closed beta, um, while it was a browser-based tool, which enabled single source of truth and all the things that we know to be true about building software in the browser, um, it didn't have like true multiplayer functionality, but as soon as they like got that product ready for the closed beta, they realized, oh my God, we have to make this multiplayer right away and immediately started building that too. And so um, sometimes you go through that process and you realize other things that just for us, in this case, the browser demands, the browser sort of demands a multiplayer functionality, um, but the wedge or the like focus and the you know, differentiator for Figma then and now remains really harnessing the power of the web and the browser to create a totally different paradigm mm -hmm. for working on products. Totally, and you know, when we talk about Figma, Figma, I think when they launched, they have this viral loop where with, because of multiplayer, someone can join the product, invite their collaborators, and even if the initial day one launch isn't totally explosive, you have this mechanism that can continue to feed the growth machine. Totally. Right? Two thirds of our weekly active users are not designers. Wow. Because of the sharing that um, and the the sort of breaking down of walls that the product enabled in this like broader space of product building, which really involves everyone in a company. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think. Dropbox had a similar journey where the, the lore of Dropbox was the space race concept where uh, Drew and Arash kind of incentivized sharing as much as possible and would award gigabytes of storage the more people that you invited and that kind of kicked off the consumer apps growth and then later led to the executive team saying, hey, we should build a, a business product on top of this. And I think Slack had a similar uh, bottom up kind of viral journey where they started as a video game very famously, ended up pivoting to the internal comm system that Stuart and team had built just for their own internal collaboration. They launched that, Andreessen kind of tweeted about it, and that started to go viral, and people downloaded it, invited their collaborators. Now, contrast that to products like Segment and Fivetran, where they're not, I, I would say, bottom up is not their main distribution. Uh, method. I, I view them as more enterprise companies. I'm just curious how the kind of the early days are different when you're going more top down than bottom up. Just any learnings that you've had. Then. Yeah. Well, I'd say it sort of depends on the segment that you're talking about. So in the early days of Fivetran, for example, it does become viral in a sense. It's not that you know you're joining your friends in a design interface or you're chatting with them on Slack, but what, what you said about breaking down walls cross-functionally, I think is really relevant when you're talking about data infrastructure because people are held back from getting their jobs done when they don't have access to the right data in a usable format in the right time. And so the ability to leverage Fivetran to get access to data from legacy databases or from your SaaS apps in one single place like a data warehouse and leverage a BI tool for visibility enables you to make business decisions that are actually based on live data and why that becomes viral is because you can't live without it once you're actually able to make complete decisions or com decisions based on complete information. Um, I think what's, what's really fun about working at a company like Fivetran is it's such a focused product. So we're really good at this one thing that nobody else wants to be good at, which is data replication. And the reason it becomes something that can grow bottoms up is because it's a data engineer, for example, who's hating their life right now trying to build and maintain data pipelines. And so you can get a bottoms up, someone, a pr practitioner who's really interested in getting a project done. But in enterprise selling, you don't, you don't get the whole enterprise because one practitioner had a project and they needed to move data from point A to point B. Um, that's where layering in a, an enterprise selling motion mm -hmm. as you're working on accelerating explosive growth um, can really help you sort of enable different departments across the company to work together and benefit from uh, the positive business outcomes that our technology is driving. Totally. And if you're a founder in the audience and you're kind of thinking through, do I go bottom up or do I go top down? 
How do you start to make that assessment in your head? I think the answer is it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and it depends on who feels the pain that you're trying to solve. So when you think about getting a product into a company's hands, you want access to the folks who are feeling the pain. So in, as an example, the data engineers, that would be the bottoms up motion. But you also need access to the folks who can't make business trajectory changing decisions without access to the outputs of the product. So in this case, data driven decisions. So while a data engineer might be the first person to say, hey, my hair's on fire, I have this problem, I can't get this done. The budget holder, the person who can actually make decisions about moving discretionary funding is the one that you really need to, to help educate about the problems that you know, a product like Fivetran can solve and also the halo effect that that can have on their ability to have agility and make decisions that are based on reality and not assumptions and incomplete data because we've all lived this. We've all had, no matter what your role is, I guarantee you've had a question you couldn't answer because you didn't have the data at your fingertips. And so it really is a unifying experience that enables you to make consistent decisions across a big enterprise. Mm -hmm. Nairi, was there ever a debate at Figma, like should we be top down or should we limit the bottom up motion at all? Or was it always pretty gung ho bottom up? You know, we've really, we really do both now. Um, in the beginning it was definitely bottoms up, but there was this amazing moment, another famous story from the Figma history um, where the product was out, it was still free. And we had a lot of people starting to use it, including within large enterprise companies. And, and, and one of those companies is Microsoft. And it had gotten really popular within Microsoft. And some, one day they reached out to Figma and they were like, listen, you have to start charging for this product. We love using it, but everyone here is worried that if you don't charge money, you're gonna die as a business. Mm -hmm. And we really don't want that to happen. So please start charging for your product. So that was like a really interesting like, meeting of like bottoms up and tops down because the tops down people are like, um, what's going on here is a free product. We're not going to let everybody adopt it. It's going to go away. Um, and today we still maintain a really robust bottoms up motion and focus and have a really incredible, you know, sales motion and, um, arguments and stories that really are what the buyers are thinking and talking about, especially as we've expanded our product suite to include a whiteboarding tool, Fig Jam, and now um, something for developers, which is called Dev Mode. So it's a it's a really interesting end to end story. That's really cool. Do you think that founders are too nervous to charge people early on or give away too much for free? Is that is that a mistake you've seen? Oh man, <sighs> I mean, you know, I think. Pricing is one of the most challenging decisions that any business will make um, in the early days and on an ongoing basis. And so, again, I don't think there's a one size fits all. In our case, you know, it sounds like we had the ability to you know, turn on pricing sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you have to remember that at the time, this idea of like working in a Google Docs for interface design was really radical. And the people who we had told about in the early days of what we were doing were like, absolutely not, yeah. no way. <laughs> not doing it, I'm gonna like change careers before I'm gonna let that be my process. Wow. And so you had to get them to like understand the benefits um, and take that leap, which over time more and more people did before you could you know, start charging for something. So totally. that was that was the Figma scenario. Totally. I think we could spend the whole session talking about pricing <laughs> and the impact it has on your ability to go to market. I'd also just acknowledge that it's okay to get pricing wrong the first one, two, three, four, five plus times. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense for it to evolve over time. And in particular, that I was talking earlier about focus. When you're focused on one specific problem that you're solving and you really attach your the business outcomes that make a difference to a business's trajectory to your product, it makes pricing and charging for something actually very easy because you're not asking for something that feels expensive. And if you ever, like when I talk to enterprise customers and they're, you know, well, that sounds expensive. The question that I always ask and I'd recommend founders ask is compared to what? Because you're comparing it to an imaginary sticker price, but what you're not thinking about is the cost of attrition, the cost of the labor to build something, the cost of maintaining that thing, and the cost of making 
the wrong decisions because you weren't enabling your team to, to leverage that. And so for me, pricing is, and that five time we've changed our pricing model more times than I'm comfortable saying out loud, but I think it's about learning. And when you're a fast growing startup, that's the most critical thing you can do is learn from customer feedback and always orient your price around the value that your product is driving. Yeah, it's interesting. As a seller, I always thought you want to charge as much as you can negotiate towards. You know, you anchor high and then you negotiate and you end up on a number that both sides feel good about. As a VC, you, you look at NDR as one of the, the main drivers of business health. And what I found is you can potentially get a customer to overpay for year one, but very unlikely they will continuously overpay forever. It just, if, if they're not getting value commensurate with what they're paying, it's a churn risk. And if you start to see uh, SaaS metrics where there's a lot of churn and deals are churning and customers aren't happy and think they're overpaying, it's really hard to recover from that. Totally. One of the interesting evolutions in SaaS is the way that we are recognizing revenue. Mm -hmm. So historically, you're charging some upfront price and it becomes an annually renewing subscription and it's just this one price and that's, and maybe you're overcharging, maybe whatever it is. In the world of consumption models, you're actually like, Fiveturn doesn't even recognize the revenue. When you sign a contract with Fiveturn, we don't recognize it until you've actually used the product. And as you use it, we are then able to report to Wall Street, this is the this is what our ARR is. And so that type of model, while very complex in terms of operations, tightly aligns the business outcomes with the customer's outcomes yeah. because you're never charging for something that your customers aren't benefiting from. Yeah, you're so incentivized on a moment by moment basis to make sure that they're successful in using the product as opposed to a model where you sell the deal, all right, we'll see you in a year for renewal. And you just, there was no one catching the fact that there's like a usage gap or some sort of a, a gap. So that, that we found the same thing at Slack where we have this fair billing policy and it really incentivizes you. You'll notice, you'll feel pain the moment usage is going down. So that's really interesting too. Um, I wanna get to mistakes and things that we see hyperscale companies get wrong. Um, maybe we dive into that right now. I guess um, it seems like these products that go viral, it's, it's, it's based on product market fit of some kind. It's based on, okay, this is the best solution I've seen to solve my problem. I'm gonna tell my friends, they're gonna feel the same way. And you have kind of this, this rocket ship effect. Um, but when you start turning that into a real business, what have you both seen go wrong? What, what comes to mind? In, in kind of taking the seeds of product market fit and trying to scale to huge revenue numbers. Sure. Um, if you'll all indulge me, I'm gonna share a consumer story, which is um, from Uber, which I still bring with me philosophically to Figma now, which is, you know, it always feels too early to invest in the types of marketing that can't immediately be measured in MQLs or ARR impact. However, it's also really important to build a relationship with your customers, your users, and your community that goes beyond the product. And so how do you do that? How do you build that trust? How do you build that relationship that's deeper? Um, and you know, I saw that at Uber, we did some performance marketing, but absolutely, and that was mostly focused on recruiting drivers and absolutely none that covered the brand overall and told a bigger story. And we suffered for it. You know, we had, you know, over time, you know, we didn't have that buoyancy that brand marketing can give you. And so um, I really believe in the power of brand marketing over time. It doesn't mean you have to spend millions and millions of dollars on TV ads, um, but it's really important to define how you're going to tell your story at, a, at the highest order level. Um, and, and connect and with your users today and build awareness about your product and brand over time with the audiences that matter to you. And so I definitely bring that lens and learning to Figma. I think it's really important. And you know, in a sales-led business, we're very product-led, but in a sales-focused business versus Uber, which was an ops-led business, you know, it's really important to do it all, do both. You know, you have to create content and marketing strategies and tactics that support the sales motion. You also have to sometimes be comfortable taking the risk of spending money, 
at hiring people and, and expending resources at things that are longer term investments. They will pay dividends. You just won't see them that quarter. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things you talked about was the longevity of the lens that you're taking when you're planning. Even when you're really early stage, small scale, you shouldn't be making investments with the SMB hat on. You should be thinking about, well, I'm planning to scale this product, so I want to build the right tech stack that I can leverage to onboard and train folks and make it. I mean, there's nothing worse than joining a company that has a terribly set up Salesforce instance because they didn't invest in it early on yep. because you just the tech debt just piles up and piles up. But um, I think that thinking about long term is is critical for a couple of reasons. One, because you're setting yourself up for scale and you're making those investments early. But two, you can't go crazy and hire everyone. Like the, it's a it's a risk, and I've lived it where you got this amazing product market fit. Your board is asking you to hit aspirational numbers. There was once a time, not more than a couple of years ago, when growth at all costs was the thing. Yeah. Uh, we're no longer in that era. So as we think about how you invest in hiring, uh, the number of times that I've been part of a sales leadership organization that overhired sellers because we were like, let's solve this problem with bodies, um, it's, it's not good for anyone. It's not good for the sellers that don't hit their numbers. It's not good for the customers who have the experience of sort of a frenetic panic from the people that represent the, the brand. Uh, and it's frankly, it's not good for your cost of sale. Yeah. So building for longevity. Yeah, I've noticed a similar thing where it's easy to overestimate how wide your product market fit is. And it's easy to assume, oh, we have product market fit with everyone. But in reality, you only have product market fit with a certain sect of customers. So if you overhire and act as if we could sell this to the world, there's going to be a lot of people who join that org who are set up to fail. Have, have you seen that as well? It sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Well, it's very, it happens all the time in sales because if you hire too many people, then there's not enough to go around. But <clears throat> even as you're thinking about what should the principles be that I build and scale this business on, number one should be focus, focusing on the biggest problem that you solve. And you don't need to hire, you don't need to verticalize your sales team right mm -hmm. away because maybe you can solve this problem in healthcare, maybe yeah. you can solve it in in the IT, but really thinking about, okay, this is the thing we know that we are building repeatable motion around and then starting to build a process around that. And that will allow you to decide, do I need to hire more people or do we need to shift the way that, or the ICP or the way that we're going to market. Um, but it's about pattern recognition and focus and not getting so excited that you are spraying and praying. Mm -hmm. 100%. I mean, so well said. I just want to like plus one this idea that adding bodies alone will solve your problems. Absolutely not. There's a lot of other ways that you need to tackle those problems before you even consider adding headcount. You know, my Uber and Figma experiences were polar opposites on that front. I was, you know, employee 275 at Uber, interestingly, also 275 at Figma. I was at Uber for three and a half years and we were, 10,000 when I left. Different business, you can't really compare. I've been at Figma about three years and we've gone from 275 to about like 1,300. So again, different businesses, totally, you can't really compare them, but there's a lot of intention that we bring to our hiring. It's been philosophical, it's the company I came into, but that's really, really important. Yeah, the other thing to think about when you're hiring, especially at this stage where you're trying to capitalize on and accelerate explosive growth is who's the profile that you're hiring for? especially for startups who are starting to think about who's the first sales hire that I want to make. Do I, should I hire a sales leader to build out a sales team or should I hire a BDR or SDR or should I hire so, you know, the, the, my opinion on this is you just choose a philosophy, which is, uh, do you want to learn or do you want to just keep trying things that you can't necessarily compare? Obviously I'm a fan of the former, but the idea is, hire one or two sales reps who are fearless, who will go out into the field and will build process that they can do as a repeatable motion. What you don't wanna do, and I've, I've seen this before where it's like, oh, first sales hire can just be like a Renaissance seller who goes around and does art instead of science. And the reality is you wanna be able to look at data points and compare them so that you can make a decision about, are we going after the right ICP? Do we have the right messaging? You were talking about being really crystal clear on the message. I think that also evolves over time because early in Fivetran's um, growth, we had great messaging around, this is what the product does for bottoms up growth. 
now we're doing quite well in the enterprise space, but we're still working on our, what language do enterprises speak mm -hmm. and what are the right words for us to use so that we can be top of mind. And that's, that's still a challenge for us. But um, in terms of the hiring profile, you really want to start with someone who can bring learnings back and like any salesperson who's offered the opportunity to give customer feedback to product is uh, just thrilled yeah. about the opportunity. So that's the type of profile that you're looking for early on. What would you tell a founder who's still looking for product market fit? Like the, the topic of this panel is your product went viral, now what? That's probably uh, a problem a lot of people would want to have. What do you do when you find yourself before that point, you're kind of tinkering and experimenting do you have any advice for founders that are in that stage? From a marketing perspective? From just product, marketing, sales, anything. Like what, what would you advise when you're kind of trying to make a product go viral, but pre that moment? Yeah, I think we all run the risk of trying to boil the ocean in that moment. Just like, well, will this work? Is this gonna work? Maybe we'll try this. And again, it just comes down to principles. Think of the three things that you want to focus on or the one type of motion or the one type of buyer that you want to focus on early on and then get enough at bats where you can make a data driven decision about, OK, this works. This doesn't work. This is where we should go from here. And then you're going to build. And this is why investing in a, a scalable tech stack early on is is critical using something like a gong or a chorus so that you can record those early conversations and learn from them and send that I mean at Fivetran. We're not early stage anymore, but we send chorus call recordings all around the company all the time. Yeah. And the marketing team will reach out to me and be like, hey, I was listening to this call. And it seems like we're struggling with this thing or right now with pricing, you know? Um, and so I think that's when, you, when you're just at the precipice of getting to explosive growth, the opportunity to create similar at bats that then inform pattern recognition is where you should be spending your time. So it sounds like be a sponge for customer feedback, essentially. An intentional sponge. Yeah, love it. And don't give up. <laughs> I mean, it takes, like, if you have conviction in the problem that you're solving with your product, you know, maybe you need like a particular feature that's gonna be the aha moment and you don't, you're not creating the aha moment. Mm -hmm. How can you create it through the product? So that's an important question to ask in that chapter. Or on the marketing side, the go to market, you know, what are the stories? You can't just tell them once. You have to repeat, repeat, repeat. And I had a boss once who said, repetition never spoiled a prayer. It's true. You can't just say something once and expect it's going to resonate. Different channels, different form factors, different ways to reach people. Um, you know, so just, you know, got to keep at it. Yeah, I think it is interesting. If you look at the companies that we all came from, there are kind of these famous moments where it wasn't a sure thing. Like Figma, we talked about Figma and the wilderness period. Um, Dropbox, the business that it became was totally different than why it went viral. It went viral as a consumer app and most of their sticky revenue is from building Dropbox for business and Dropbox for enterprise. Slack, you know, we talked about the, the video game era where it was just a pure pivot. Yeah. So it is kind of interesting. And didn't Segment have a similar story? Segment did have a similar story. Yeah, exactly right. Starting with one product in mind and then realizing that they, five turn two, realizing that they were burdened with this other really hard problem that they didn't intend to solve from the beginning and then pivoted and decided to solve because it really was the thing that nobody else wanted to solve. Totally. And it's so interesting because now there's way more SaaS companies than I think the era that these companies were talking about were founded. So there's probably less real estate up for grabs and there's just an extra difficult element of product market fit. You also have to kind of avoid where someone else has found explosive product market fit. So I think your advice of don't give up is spot on. Yeah. Iteration is so find, important. Find other founders to talk to for support. Yeah. Don't give up. It's a lonely journey. It's a alone. very lonely job. Well, and I think it all comes back to the customer. Focusing on the customer feedback that you yes. get. Working on pattern recognition so you can distill signal from noise and really understand, am I solving the biggest business problem that is out there? Or am I attaching to a nice to have project that you know, then deals keep slipping because they get deprioritized. And, you know, what we think about in our sales process is, okay, so what is the current state of your company? What are the challenges associated with that current state? And then what would your ideal state be uh, as you think about aspirational brands? What are the impact, what would the impact of that ideal state be? And then, only then, after we fully, deeply understand our potential customers, 
do we then talk about, okay, well, here's how we do it. Here's how we do it differently than other solutions, including do nothing. And here's where we've done it before. And so when you talk about stories and not just telling one story, the proof points are so critical because when you're selling to a company who is thinking aspirationally about what they could be next, if you can help bring them on that journey with you to help them solve a problem that they can't solve on their own and give them examples of other companies who have gone before them that have had the business outcome that they are looking for, to me, that's, that's not selling, that's just educating and then the buyer persuades themselves. Totally. Um, I know we're close to time. We want to open it up for questions. The last thing I'd like to ask, um, Lauren, I'd love for you to tell the story of 20 sales and just kind of talk about what you're interested in investing in and kind of what informs your investing approach. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So uh, I recently started a fund called 20 sales uh, with seven other women in sales leadership. Um, and so we've got eight GPs. We've already made Handful, more than a handful of investments um, alongside some really incredible uh, investors and several of them are here today. Uh, what we're really focused on is where we can add value to the go-to-market motion. So traditionally and respectfully, uh, a venture capital investor has some operating experience. You have more than, that, than most, um, but doesn't necessarily have a full-time operating gig at the time. So we have eight senior sales, C-level, VP-level sales and uh, customer success leaders who are living and breathing the cutting edge of the challenges at, that companies at different stages are facing when it comes to go-to-market. And we believe it's, it's a critical, a, a critical skill set that we can help founders. A lot of time a founder is technical or a founder has a focus that's not around go-to-market. And the, being an expert in go-to-market is certainly not a prerequisite for founding an incredible company. So that's where we really look for where we can help accelerate the growth of these early, generally B2B SaaS companies, but um, a, a, an ideally diverse founder set as well. That's awesome. And I'd love to ask you a similar question, Nairi. Like, what would you look for as an investor in this era? If you talk to early stage companies, what types of questions would you ask? What types of qualities would you look for? Where do you think there's opportunity as an investor going forward? Yeah, um, I feel really lucky to have been able to work for iconic founders in my time. Um, and so for me, it's all about the founder. It just really is their um, vision, their um, leadership qualities, their passion, their um, ability and willingness to run through walls. And um, I think that the founders are the magic that make founder led companies so special. Really what what types of, so what types of questions would you ask if you're kind of having investor conversations? What helps you get to that point of going, yeah. you've got that special quality? I think that if you're just spending time with founders, which is, you know, investors do outside of just the actual coming to the partner meeting and presenting, mm -hmm. you really get a feel for who they are as a human mm -hmm. behind the deck. Yeah. Who's the person behind the slides um, that they're presenting to your partnership? And you get a feel for their passion, their humanity, their um, experience. And, you know, I think that there is a real um, almost undefinable quality that when you see it, you know it. Yeah. I hate to give you that non-answer, but that's how I feel. Certainly how I've felt, you know, when I met Travis Kalanick for the first time, when I met Dylan Field for the it's first It's the feeling time. of I want to work for this yes. person. And in a world where you have to recruit so much and hire so many people, you do kind of need that quality. And they're also looking so far ahead, way further ahead than anyone else mm -hmm. always. And so you need that. Yeah, they better have precise you need judgment. That. Yeah. yeah. And we've all worked at companies where the founders started with one idea and then pivoted to a different idea. Yeah. So over indexing on the idea can be limiting yes. when you've identified someone. And for me, the top quality I look for is resilience and they'll just run through walls to to solve the biggest problem that they can and yeah. have passion for it um even if the the idea evolves over time because some of the best ideas were iteration number 3.5 yeah that's right cool um let's open it up for questions uh does anyone have a question they'd like to ask yes absolutely should we oh, yeah okay. If, if you come up to the mic, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Thank you. 
Let's give her a round of applause. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks for getting this session going. Yeah, I have a question about brand marketing and some of that longer term investment. Uh, any strategies you've used to persuade or convince founders that don't have a background in marketing and maybe don't see the value of uh, brand marketing to actually invest in that? Yeah. Honestly, one of the best ways I have found is just to find the qualitative feedback that you're getting on the work that you're putting out into the world. Whether it's the sales team coming to you and being like, oh my God, I literally could not have gotten this deal done without this event that you threw. Mm -hmm. Or, um, oh my gosh, look at this post on Reddit about Figma that says X, right? Those types of qualitative feedback actually resonate and they do give you significant signal even if they're not immediately measurable. So that's one. The second is, I think it's also really important to be strong in your point of view on what is and isn't measurable and not get boxed into you know, using all sorts of tools that are out there that give you some fake sense of how you're doing overall from a brand perspective that are really just a way to manage up. So if you bring a strong point of view, educate your leadership, your founder, your CEO, and then you know find the, the pockets of feedback and impact that you can show, I think that's like a really powerful combination. Um, and just, you know, experiment. Don't try to go from zero to 60, you know, put some experiments out there, see how they go, come back, keep iterating, bring in outsiders, point to out other companies. Everyone's aspirational, right? So use that to your advantage. Those are some of the strategies I've used. Thank you so much. That's great feedback. Okay. Luck. It's also not unique to marketing. Mm. It's, it's kind of back to the proof points that I was talking about, which is, if you can show how other companies got from A to B by leveraging an investment that feels large at the time but actually pays off in the future, then you're helping your founder or your, your C-level leader see the future that they couldn't imagine for themselves and then you become the person that takes them with you on that journey to get there. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anything you want to add, Mike? What's that? So anything you want to add, Mike? It's definitely not my area of expertise, <laughs> so I defer. Valid. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Um, does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? It is interesting. Um, feel free. If anyone has one they want to ask, feel free to raise your hand. But how much of the conversation is happening without you? As you know, Figma's not in those conversations. You know, your customers are kind of talking to each other. And I think that's the halo effect of marketing. Absolutely. You know, how can you get people to have aha moments outside of the product that make them think differently, both about themselves and about you, the product, the brand, the company, and then, you know, have that be in the water, yeah. you know? That has exponential compounding effects over time that you just simply can't measure. Um, it's not to say you shouldn't do measurable marketing to you. Absolutely should. They work in partnership with each other. It's not about one or the other. Um, but yeah, it's, it's our sales team. I really find are some of the best evangelists for some of this work because they want those stories. They want that content and they love using it and they love reporting back on how it's going. You know, it's, I'm glad you brought up partnership because one of the things we haven't really talked about today is how you can go to market with other companies and, and partners. And um, in terms of building your brand in the market, like a better together story with other types of businesses. So in our case, we're moving data from one place to another and we partner very closely with the data sources and the data destinations like the data cloud warehouses, for example, um, cloud data warehouses. And we co-market with them mm -hmm. and to me that helps when you're a buyer you're not like okay today i'm thinking about the data pipeline mm -hmm. how am i going to just get that you're like what is the bigger picture associated with my business outcome that i'm looking for okay this stack they seem like they work well together there's all this ex all these examples where they do and so to the extent that you can leverage other companies and partners as an extension of your sales and marketing team to me that has a, a halo effect to use your term awesome yeah, I have a question. So uh, Figma did not make money for the first five years. Um, so what is that moment where you feel like uh, you should turn on monetization if you have explosive growth? Say it one more time. Um, it's closer to the mic. Figma yeah. did not make any yeah. money for the first five years. So what is that moment where you were like, okay, we should turn on monetization and go all in on GTM? Yeah. Because for five years they were building. So right. I'm in the same position right now. I, I, I have good growth going 
every day, but I just don't know if I should turn on monetization now or at a million users. Totally, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, were you here for that part? So mm -hmm. I can tell the story again, but basically, you know, you need to listen to your customers a little bit, understand like how enmeshed they are in your product already. Um, you know, you can do some testing and learning. You definitely do the user research um, to inform some of the pricing decisions. At the end of the day, it's a judgment call and you can use some of the quantitative inputs to inform it. But, um, you know, it, go, it depends a little bit on like what else is on your roadmap, right? When are you adding those other things? Will they add a d differentiated value? It's a nice idea to turn on monetization when you're potentially adding in a layer um, from a product perspective. It always kind of feels like a nice moment. But, um, you know, learning from the Figma experience, you know, don't wait too long. <laughs> And it's okay not to get it right the first time. That's part of what we were talking about earlier also. It's like nobody's pricing stays exactly the same for the entirety of their growth trajectory. And I would say from a sales perspective, resist the urge to create all you can eat agreements with your customers because one of these days that's not gonna be scalable for you and they're very hard to get out of. Um, so as you continue to scale and evolve your pricing methodology, uh, I'd say just keep collecting information from your customers and be very transparent about why you're pricing in the way that you are. Um, again, for our business, it's, it's consumption oriented and when you're aligned with the customer outcomes, it's, it's not expensive anymore. Transparent pricing really is a powerful way to think about it. And I know maybe it's you know not always the norm, but we are the same. Um, and the pricing you see on the Figma website is the pricing everybody gets. Yeah. There are no discounts. There's no way to do the first deal and get more and then, okay, maybe you have to cut it the next time. It just, the pricing is what it is. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. The first one is you mentioned qualitative data and how it can be really impactful. How do you know when it's not a red herring and it's something that you should actually bet on, especially if you're gonna be presenting it to founders and things like that? Yeah. And then the second question was, um, let me just go like, so you mentioned that um, looking at how other companies have done investments and how it's paid off for them, how would you find that kind of information? Like, is it something you can just Google? Because a lot of times, you know, people aren't super transparent about it. It's kind of under the hood. Yeah. I mean, I can start. I would love to hear from Lauren yeah. too, but you know, we talked about founders having a lonely job. Working in a startup and hyper growth, hyper scale, pre product, pre revenue is also a lonely job, right? And so part of that is to your second question, finding community with people who are doing a similar role at other organizations. I think that was one of my biggest learnings coming to Silicon Valley from like a very different environment, which was politics, which was just how willing and able people are to lean in and help. Um, and in those moments where you're sort of stuck or just want point of view, reach out to people. You'll, I think you can, if you can create a little cohort of people in similar roles, similar stages, you can really share learnings that can be valuable um, bi-directionally. So that's, that's what I'd say on that one. Yeah, I agree. That's actually how 20 Sales started our fund is that we were a group of sales leaders who were all going through very similar challenges and just built a community, started our own Slack channel and uh, worked through for a couple of years each other's challenges and learn from each other's and we, we also recommend products to each other and so that type of community um, helps accelerate the virality and then I also just wanted to address you were talking about red herrings and similarly I was thinking about um, distilling signal from noise when you're doing customer research in the form of selling so in this case what I'd say is so, so critical as you're bringing your product to market is qualification because you don't want to spend a lot of resources from a marketing perspective or from a sales perspective running a proof of value with a customer that you're never going to be able to solve their problem or that was never going to buy in the first place. And so it is so critical. The thing I think the most critical step in any go to market motion is qualifying the right leads to invest your company's resources after and qualifying out early because it's better, to, it's totally fine to lose a deal in stage one. It's not fine to lose the deal in stage five because you've already dumped a ton of time and resources into it. And then really quickly on your first question, you know, I don't over index on an N of one, right? So obviously you wanna be seeing a sustained pattern of over time of what's resonating. You're already doing marketing that's aligned to your overall like company 
um, value prop, product value prop, right? So it's not so random already. And so of the like experiments that you're running tactically, you know, see, see sort of like, you just can't over index on an N of one. So seeing that sustained feedback over time for us, that's um, really important because we are very engaged with our community and get a lot of feedback across the board. So just trying to really stay close to what is sustained over time. And then, you know, you have to be willing to take some risks and see things fail because otherwise you're not pushing hard enough. I think that's a great thank note you. to wrap on. First of all, thank you for your question. Thank you all for joining. And thank, thank you, Lauren and Nairi, so much for joining this panel. It's been awesome to host you. And uh, thanks for attending, everyone. Thanks, Mike.